Hi, Misha here, and just had this come in. It uh, is from, or at least imported by, Century Arms. But ironically, I actually got it from Arsenal, or K-Bar, rather. But this is a current 2021 production Romanian Cuger PSL 54. And in the past, we've shown you and shot this one here. This is my old uh, FPK marked one from about 20 years back. So, yeah, 2001 versus 2021. I thought it would be interesting and fun to compare how these are still similar and how they have differences, how the design has kind of changed over the years. This is, of course, chambered for 762 by 54 r and is often called a Dragonov, but it's not. It's a giant Kalashnikov. So with that, we'll go to the table, see what comes in the box, do some comparisons, and try to have some fun with this. So this is the box the 2020 and 2021 models comes in. Anyone who bought one of the old school PSL 54s, they were literally just a cardboard box with lots of ink and uh, lots of grease spills and splatters. Very uh, mill syrup. So the boxing's a little better. So we have foam cut out here. Very impressive. Have your uh, scope in a box. It is a new production scope. We'll look at it a little more later. You get one greasy mag and some oddly greasy plastic. Apparently plastic rusts. And the usual manual paperwork. Yeah, as usual. I have no idea which way's up. You know the deal here. Century arm stuff. So presentation is certainly better. That's why guys are trying to get this out. Usually a little NRA card or what have you. Boring stuff. And then, of course, the gun itself comes with the wonderful Century tag. You get the deal. And here it is. I already took the flag out. Safety usually comes on. It's already off. And there we are. Out of the box. So with that, let's... Uh, Talk a bit more about the features and compare it with the original FPK. I can't resist a little history. And the PSL certainly has a good bit behind it. PSL essentially stands for an Romanian scoped self-loading or semi-automatic rifle. Take note, ADF. And it was officially adopted in 1974. It fired 7.62 by 54R, the standard Soviet or Russian round that dates back to the late 19th century, and is based on the Kalashnikov long stroke cast piston system with two lug rotating bolt. And many might ask why Romania Kuzier didn't just, you know, go with the Dragunov. Well, that's because relations between Russia and Romania really broke down in 1968. Plus, Russia wasn't keen on giving production license to other nations. They would happily sell SVD the Dragunovs, but very few nations produced them outside of the Soviet Union. And if this also seems kind of similar to what Zastava did in Yugoslavia with the M76, there was actually some commonality there. So they basically scaled up the AK, or if you like, the RPK. It has a 1.5 millimeter extra thick receiver, reinforced bulge front trunnion. Has a chrome lined cold hammer forged barrel, including the muzzle brake, it's about 24 and a half inches. Overall length, we're at about 45 and a quarter inches. And this is actually a pretty svelte rifle at about nine and a half pounds empty, but that does include its, its optic. And speaking of its optic, this is a copy of the Russian 
PSO1. The Romanian designation is LPS, and the LPS Type 1, much like the scope that comes with this, was battery powered. But very soon after the PSL was adopted, the P, excuse me, the LPS Type 1 was taken out of production and replaced by this, the LPS Type 2. This is still a 4 power, 4x24 four optic. But instead of having a battery compartment, it uses tritium for illumination. It was also designed to be a little bit cheaper and more cost effective, faster, easier to mass produce. And these were built in Bucharest by a, Rom a Romanian optics company, which actually got its start with Zeiss in Germany. So good start. And they've been producing optics at that time for approximately 40 years. So a little before World War II. So this went into the Romanian military in the mid 70s and by the early 80s was quite a common rifle. Now this is not a sniper's weapon. This is a DMR, designated marksman rifle. The idea was your average conscript could pick one up. He could use his basic training on the Kalashnikov and be able to handle this. And it was considered capable of two to two and a half MOA, and some of them could do better than that, out to 800 meters, extending the range past both the AK and the RPK. And of course, as you know, it has standard AK controls. Safety, reciprocating handle, mag release. Probably the most unique feature that makes it not AK is the fact that it does have an automatic last round bolt hold open, but it does not have an external release. Uh, the buttstock is a little different because it's half moon cut. And the handguards, of course, are their own pattern. And this has its own length gas system. And these are still built for military clients to this very day. And they started to be built, at least in ATF, U.S. government compliant form, for the American market in the late 90s. And some early names included SSG-97 for I.O. We also had FPK and FPK Dragunov for Intrac, or those are usually sold by Tennessee Gun. And Century was started off using the Romac 3, R-O-M-A-K, Roman number 3. And later the name would evolve into PSL, there would also be PSL 54C, and now PSL 54. And these have been imported pretty continuously with a few breaks here and there since the late 90s. However, there have been changes. And many of them relate to the fact that earlier imports, while not always built from military guns, could and often were built by just taking a military PSL, giving it a fresh barrel, and putting it on an ATF compliant two pin hole receiver. And of course, much has happened with the PM63. There were changes in the production methodology between the 70s and, well, 2020, 2021. So yeah, here is the old school marked FPK Dragunov. And again, I've had this one for a few years and you've seen it in several videos. Before we move too far forward, yeah, let's look what's in the scope box. I've actually already opened this one time. So it won't be as neat as it once was, but be all right. It's, yeah, just, the, the thing they really take away here, it's a new optic, not a surplus one that a lot of the old ones used to come with. Here it is, battery powered. Pretty, Pretty common, you actually see this model shipped on quite a few guns now, if I can get this back on now. Yet yeah, it is conscript proof, but not apparently Misha proof. There we go. My 
hands are greasy. <laughs> so yeah, we get the optic, brand new, four power optic. Let's go ahead and go ahead and slide it on. Assuming they pre-fit it, let's find out. These of course are adjustables on the rail, but ideally when you have a gun and scope matched up, they will go right on. There's a screw you can adjust there, but of course being an optic you want it tight Sliding on the Dragonov style rail and locking on and Of course, it's not just a bare optic you get The eye cup Actually get a modern style cover. The old school ones had uh, leather here. These are completely nylon, except for the strap. If I can get it undone here. Something tells me that's probably not real leather. What do you think? And I believe there is a lens in here or something else. There's also a tool. And you get a manual. But this is 2021. We have the internet. So, really, yeah. So the presentation is uh, it's pretty good with these, at least compared to the old days of getting an old surplus scope. The surplus ones would work, but, well, you know how glass ages. And some were better than others. But, that's the advantage here. You get new parts with a new 10 round mag. So that's an advantage of the new guns. And these are all brand new serial matching parts. Quite nice. However, these older PSLs, I had a few things to recommend them too. Yeah, you got a surplus scope. Notice this is not the battery powered one. And typically if you had one with the tritium, it's of course gonna be long dead, but it is military. That's kind of neat. They came with this here, a leather sling. Serials yeah, could or could not be matching. But the real advantage were the other parts you got. They came with a mag pouch, typically with four mags. And if you were really lucky, the serials on the mags actually matched the rifle. Inside, we had a pretty standard AK tube cleaning kit had a three-piece sectional rod which you absolutely should not use on your gun but it's nice to have you would get some other doodads and whatnots uh, let's see there's a tool in here somewhere you know a little uh, takedown tool And there is a sight tool. This one also, for whatever reason, came with a broken shell extractor. Not all of these did. And that's kind of the deal. You, you kind of just got what you got with these. Um, some came with more, some came with less. This one has an oil bottle deep down in here, but it's a standard, standard oiler that you'd expect. The point is, it was a surplus gun that 
came with surplus accessories, including some pretty neat pouch variations. Bring my cleaning rod back now that they're all the way. Very nice, tight fit. So it's kind of up to you. I would definitely think the additional mags are worth it, but since they were surplus, they may not work. And not all of your older guns were made from surplus parts. Some of them were new production because different importers did over time. See there with this one mag, it's not doing the bolt hold open. That's pretty standard for some of these as springs wear out. But the original impulse do have the hold open catch here. If you come across one of these that does not have it, very good chance it's one of the US assembled guns because for whatever reason, they did not install them. So with that, let's compare the way the parts were manufactured with how they are manufactured today. Okay, that works well. <laughs> and they do hold open when the when mag is removed. And go from there. So let's start with the mags. There are some differences. This is the early mag. 10 rounds. Metal follower. And you'll notice the bolt hold up and the device catch here. And I've seen these either be phosphated or blued from the earlier guns, just as the guns themselves. Here's our modern mag. It has a much coarser matter phosphating. And this is a plastic or polymer follower. Still has the catch in the back. Kind of makes me wonder, since that is plastic, will it eventually wear down versus the other one here? Sorry guys, let me get this right way. I don't know. I understand why they did a polymer plastic follower because that's less likely to seize up in the magazine. Same reason a lot of USGI mags went away from metal. So that's one thing. And of course, mags can be changed out. All right, looking at the front ends, of course, these both have about a 23 in some change cold hammer forge chrome line barrel with about a one and nine and a half twist. Not exactly that, but close enough for government work. The earlier imports could often have a removable muzzle device, muzzle brake on the uh, 14 millimeter threads. I'm gonna tilt this down just a bit and then press the D10 in. Of course, that is standard AK threading. So in addition to that, because these were military barrels from military guns, they had bayonet lugs. Now, different companies had different methods of dealing with this. They could not import them, thanks to the 1989 uh, regulations to the White House, with the bayonet lug being attacked. Sometimes they would just shave off the wings. Sometimes they would shave off the entire block, just leaving a band here. Sometimes they would remove it all together, just kind of leaving a step in the barrel there. And sometimes they would totally forget about it and it would pretty much come in as a working payonet lug. With the 2021 gun, you'll notice a very similar looking muzzle device, but it is not threaded. It is actually pinned on. 
This is good for import because it means you don't have a threaded barrel. But even for military production guns, they were sometimes, well actually a lot of them had this pinned on style, even for the Romanian military. So it was kind of an option that Kuger did, uh, threaded with removable or pinned on. The benefits to this, potentially better accuracy. The benefits to removable, well, you could clean it easier, get to your muzzle easier. And of course you could install other devices, namely a uh, blank fire device for training. Get my going here, here we go. What's also neat about these muzzle brakes that they came with, they were serialized to the gun, at least on some. And it uses the standard AK detent. So that's the barrel. Looking at the muzzle, some came in with a screwed on muzzle brake. Others, even from the beginning, came, on, came in with a pinned on one, as you see here. Some of the screw ons were just removable because I don't think they really caught them. And some had a small amount of silver solder or tack weld to keep them from unscrewing. Either way, the brake looked the same. It's just two different patterns. The bayonet lug was also a thing. This one came in with the lug, but the wings have been shaved down. I restored them. Why not? But even from the beginning, some, especially ones built from newer parts, simply had no lug whatsoever. Moving back, we can see a pretty noticeable difference on the gas block. This is the kind of early original machined type with the pretty good 45 degree angle. New ones like this have an investment cast type one that is more sharp edged, more rounded off. Functionally, this is fine. Actually, I kind of think the cast one looks a little neater. And this is common. Russia started in the early 70s going to cast parts for their AKMs, and Romania followed suit in the 80s and running through the 90s. So that's one difference. Handguards are pretty similar. <clears throat> the charging handle here has a very distinctive cut here. It's a little simplified. And the machining where the lightning cuts at is a little more basic. Also the machining on the buttstocks. This is a little different styling versus here. This is more squared off. Also something else I noted. This is the standard bottom plate, which is just there because there's a screw for attaching it. Just covers it. Just a slick kind of, it's not Bakelite, but you know, old school polymer. This has a more modern polymer with a more of a matte finish. It's honestly probably tougher. But it also <laughs> has a Phillips head screw, which I think a lot of us complain about. So, when I said the magazines could be blued or phosphated with the older guns, that also extended to some of the parts, like the bolt carrier or gas tube or even top cover. These could be blued depending on the finish of the original military service gun. But because of the way the law has written, because the original receiver had three axis pinholes, the third one was only an out of battery, a safety sear, the ATF considered that an auto sear because of course they did. Yeah, they had to rebuild these on US specific receivers. That was kind of the main concession and still is today of the PSL. So your receivers are almost universally gonna be phosphated because they were produced in modern times. This is also why you don't see 
uh, you know, CNR 50 year old plus PSLs and probably never will because they're technically machine guns, even though all of them are only capable of self-loading of single shot per trigger pull. So yeah, the receivers are gonna be phosphated on the old ones, but the parts can be either blued or phosphated, just depending. But with your newer guns, since they are all factory new production, they're gonna have pretty much an all phosphate finish, and it's kind of the same coarse phosphating as with the magazine. That's not to say they are rough. They are not. Actually quite smooth. But the phosphating itself is a little coarser. And the differences will continue. The furniture is worth pointing out. The finish used is a little different, but what kind of sticks out to me, the carving of the grip area, the comb area, it's a little rounder and a little more svelte on at least this gun. Again, older guns can vary quite a bit. But on this new gun, it is a little beefier and certainly more squared off. I think you can, there, it's just a more squared off grip. And the comb is a little thicker there in the inlet. Just manufacturing, and this has more of a, it's still kind of a shellac finish, but it has more of an oil finish versus the, uh, the other one. Now they both still have the same sling swivel and they both have a steel butt plate, which is spring loaded to help you with the recoil of the mighty 762 by 54 R cartridge. And with that, let's get a little more up close and talk about a few individual parts in detail at the other table. Some of the other small parts were originally machined, like the handguard retainer here. And of course, these would go to castings. I actually kind of like the cast one a little more too here, because it's just a more rounded area, whereas this is very sharp edged, squared off. It's just differences. Different uh, markings. Of course, different importers. They both still have the Dragonov inspired scope rail. They both have dimpled magwells. Now the fire control group area would not have the XY stampings because it's the heavier receiver. Another component that was originally machined was the trigger group. Later ones like this are cast, but there is an advantage. This is a wider shoe than the early ones. And you can tell them apart because the cast triggers have a hollow place in the back, whereas the milled ones do not. So it's up to you. Neither of these are what you would consider match grade triggers, guys. And the internals are pretty much, yeah, pretty much the same. And they both have adjustable backup iron sights that you can actually use under the scope. It was designed in such a way that it will work with that. Yeah, it's pretty much a standard Dragon off route, which is a little different from an AK. It's meant to be QD. This is an odd angle to do it at. And this one's new, so it's not really fitted yet. But uh, just go on and it has a screw to adjust the tension, much like anything else. Now I know most reviews, correctly and aptly so, when they talk about the PSL or any Dragonov-esque gun, we're going to focus on accuracy, groups, range. For some reason, that's not something I can do. So I thought I would try to give my own twist to it by talking about 
bit of the history, but more of the manufacturing differences and the quality of a modern gun these would be you know an old one the uh, scopes are interesting too that you do get less of a mill or at least a traditional romanian mill scope and more of a modern one with it it's kind of up to you it's probably effectively a better scope in fact the fact that you are getting all new parts is probably better but, especially when it comes to Romanian stuff, there's something infinitely charming about a pouch of mystery surplus gear. And you really didn't know what you would get with these. Pouch, pattern, scope even, <laughs> could vary. It was a little more fun back then. Of course, these were a lot less money. Between around 90, Eight ninety nine when the Romac 3 started coming in and the FPKs like this one and then the Century PSLs and PSL 54Cs and PSL 54s for about the first 10 years prices remained very low um, 700 bucks for an import with the scope with some accessories uh, 600 without and you could get some US builds including from Century for 500 or even 400 with just like one mag and usually no scope. So it's kind of neat and they were very underappreciated. I think because of the low price. Now, people seem to appreciate these, but unfortunately prices have gone up dramatically. Now part of this is just unavoidable. The economy in Romania is different than it was 20 years ago. And since these are being built from all new production parts, there's just a higher investment cost in doing them. But it also is the U.S. market now and the way people perceive such guns. These climbed up to 2000 And then three... Now they're back down to about 2,500, I would say, for brand new. It's up to you if they're worth it. They are authentic imports, just like the old ones. And from a shooting point of view, they're certainly equal in terms of the smoothness of the bolt and the trigger. And I would actually say this one's well broken in. It's really no smoother. For being a brand new gun, this guy here is really quite smooth. And since it does have the modern wider trigger, it will probably be more comfortable to some people. And like I said, I can't really do accuracy. That's just, yeah, where it is. But you know, can Rob Ski, aka Operators Union, and I was talking with him about doing this video. And he very much feels that the newer guns, the 2020, 2021 guns, hold better groups, better accuracy, what have you, compared with older guns. And like me, he's, he's had both to play with. So I defer to the expert on that. And that makes sense if these are all new guns not use parts. And we know that Century and Kuger have both kind of upped their quality control since around 2014, 2015. And I think it does show. It is a smoother gun. I do find a few things like the squared off stock a little less attractive. I don't mind things like the cast parts because that's just how modern stuff goes. I do kind of lament losing the bayonet lug, but Honestly, if you're not going to have it, it's better not to have anything on the barrel than something that's obviously cut off and machined off. So I think if the price tag doesn't put you off to the modern PSLs, it is a good gun. And um, they're finally not underrated, at least. They are kind of getting their just desserts and recognized for what they are. Are they as accurate as a true SV Dragonov? No. But 
their minute of man, you know, two MOA, give or take, maybe a little tighter with newer guns. The main thing is they're very easy to use, that you have the same manual of arms as an AK, and they're just as reliable as an AK. They're plenty durable, especially for a, a DMR. Most, you know, sniper guns are a little bit fidgety. These things are built about as well as you can design a gun for range and accuracy. So you do have that in its favor. Magazines have been cheap, they've been expensive. Right now they're kind of in between. I would definitely suggest picking up four or five just to have them because they can wear out. And I'm still not convinced about the, um, the modern polymer mags. That uh, plastic follower here, I don't mind, but I have to wonder about this uh, whole open trip if it might uh, eventually wear out. And it would be nice if they at least did give you two mags for the money, but um, hey, instead of that, you got a slightly fancier box. So I'm curious, what are your experiences with the PSL or the FBK or the Romac 3 or maybe even the SSG 97? Maybe you ended up with one of the IO guns. Let's uh, talk about them in the comments. They are quite neat. They've seen a lot of military service and continue to do so to this very day. They're definitely up there with the Dragunov and probably have seen more use than, say, stuff out of Yugoslavia and Serbia like the M76 and M91 because Kuger has produced for all kinds of nations, not just Romania. So yeah, let's have a discussion. And again, for accuracy stuff, definitely check out other channels like AK Operating and plenty of good things out there. Guys, if I could, I would, I promise, but I can't, so I won't. As always, if you could, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. Been making some changes over there, changing, adding some perks, so bear with me as I restructure a bit. But uh, we'll get there. I appreciate your patience and for tuning in. This is Misha, and catch you very soon next time.